Mm-hmm. We did it. Well, we are here. I'll, we're live now. Now. Okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend it worked perfectly and we're on time and congratulate ourselves on a job well done. Mm-hmm. I was job. just telling Jen that I feel like we're just like a little bit too old to have a podcast because <laughs> we yeah. are um, not... <laughs> Not always good at the at the other side of the things, the That's behind the scenes. But we always manage. So we're here and we're yeah. so happy to be here. Yeah. Somebody asked me today if we, um, Christina asked me, uh, Christina McGrath asked me if we prefer the going live format. And, you know, I think it depends. Um, sometimes mm-hmm. it's fun to get a little bit of live audience. Sometimes it's nice to record like, um, you know, ahead of time. More casually. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I have a lot of fun live and sometimes I'm like, oh no, like right now in my head, I'm like, don't have your stress face on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, uh, am I twitching? <laughs> oh, One Christina McGrath is here face. right now. Yeah, hey, Christina. <laughs> hey, uh, but we are trying to decide if we like the live format better than the pre-recorded format. There's definitely pluses and minuses. So thank you for indulging us while we continue to experiment. And uh, we are here live this week for a fit question grab bag. Um, We've got a couple questions in advance, but if you are here live with us and you have anything you want us to talk about, please feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm keeping my eyes on that as we go. Uh, You have anything to say before we get started, Jen? No. I want to talk about my dress. (laughs) Yeah. So Say I've something. been doing a lot of wardrobe planning. So um, I have been using, because I have a lot of colors that I'm really excited about for spring. And some of them are for our Rare Birds collection. And, you know, so I have been super excited about doing like a little module capsule, right? So that's like, um, we all know a capsule wardrobe is when you take like a million pieces or in your wardrobe and make them all go together. But like a module is just like a little snippet. So the one I'm using as a template is like one layering piece and um three tops and two bottoms and so i've worked a dress into there but yeah i just want to say that i'm really excited about it and it feels really fun for spring to be kind of building something around the knits that i'm making for myself and um yeah just a reminder that uh our creativity flourishes when we use it in multiple ways yes so wait the dress you're wearing right now you sewed that yeah you made that yeah. It's so lovely. Thanks. I had a dress that I really um, liked from a sustainable fashion brand, but it didn't have any bust arts. And so the underarm got worn out really quick. I mean, really quick is relative. Like if I spend $200 for something really quick is anything that uh, becomes not cool after l- less than like eight years. I'm sorry. But like if I'm spending $200 for a garment, it needs to like freaking last. I agree. I agree. I mean, I'm willing to spend money. Like I have dresses in my wardrobe for sure that I spent that much money on, but I didn't, um, like I have had them now since I was probably in my twenties when I last had that much disposable income. (laughs) So, you know, then I feel like, okay, great. You've paid for yourself for sure. But if I spend like, like with jeans, man, I don't buy expensive jeans because even when I buy expensive jeans, I destroy them just as quickly as when I buy inexpensive jeans. And then it just feels like I'm throwing extra money away instead of, you know? Yeah. And like, I love linen. Linen's my favorite fiber to wear um, in wovens. Um, And it doesn't hold up well to friction. It holds up really well in the wash. It's really durable, but friction is not its friend. And um, that means like things that don't have set in sleeves and don't have bust starts get so much wear in the underarm that they wear out really quick. And so I wanted to put together, so I just like cut apart the pattern, right? And then I traced it off. I added bust starts, added just a little bit more ease through the hip um, for preference. And then we made it in, um, this is like a rayon linen blend. So it's a little bit more nice. wrinkle reduced and it's got a little bit of um, like the drape has an element of bounce to it now like a little, a little swingy drape instead of just regular linen drape. So yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Sometimes using a a blended fiber, even though on paper, it might not be, we've talked about this in our sustainability episodes. Sometimes the thing that's on paper, not the most sustainable choice actually is in your wardrobe 
the most sustainable choice. So then it makes total sense to me that linen would do really well with a blended fiber in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like yeah. linen and silk together in yarn. That's my favorite, one of my favorite yarn combinations. Same. Possible. Mm -hmm. It's so lovely. Yeah. It's really nice. And it has like just a bit more durability, I think, than regular silk, but um, a little more structure too, to the fiber. Oh, love it. Okay. Um, Allison and Cindy both said hi. 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 Uh, Cindy, Cindy specifically said hi, Jen. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> I'm sitting pretty really far away from my keyboard, guys, so I can't actually see the two. It's okay. I'm the reporter. Us. Yes. Reporter Bess. <laughs> so let's get into our questions. Since I'm the reporter, I have questions to report. You all know how I do this. It is like these questions are in my mind. I don't have them written down. So if I make an error... I'm so sorry, but I remember, I remember them. So Jordan um, asked specifically about vertical bus starts. We talked about vertical bus starts a bit last week. We were talking about bus starts in general, right? And we mentioned vertical bus starts sometimes. I'm a huge fan of them. Jen is obviously also a fan of them, but they work better for my body is what I mean when I say I'm a huge fan of them. Whereas Jen uh, finds that horizontal bus starts are more important for her. And so Jordan suspects that she, like me, would benefit from vertical bus starts maybe even more than horizontal. And there's a few other folks out there that I know that I'm thinking of that feel the same way. Um, and so she wants to know a little more about how we go about adding them in. Yeah. So I'll hop in first and then Jen will wrap up and cover anything that Perfect. I didn't. Yeah. Okay. So here's the sort of very technical step-by-step -step process for you, Jordan. Um, you have your stitch gauge. You want to decide how much ease you're adding to the front only. So how many stitches you want to add. Um, if I'm adding them for myself, I typically try to add um, at least like 75% of what I would need to have the intended ease at the full bust. I wouldn't necessarily worry about adding 100% of that because there is flexibility in that ease. And I like to balance um, not having to figure out as many increases and decreases. So I'll, depending on how fine the stitch gauge is, right? Sometimes I'm aiming for more like 75%. In other words, if I... I'm knitting a garment that would have two inches of positive ease at the full bust, and I am getting zero inches positive ease at the full bust for myself, then I'm looking to add about an inch and a half, two inches to the front, right? So I'm going to figure out how many stitches that is and divide them by my two breasts because we're adding two columns of increases here. Um, and then work out, you know, how many increases I need, how many increased pairs, and um, I try to put those in for myself. It's like an inch or two. You're looking at um, coming from the top down or from the bottom up, like how much space on your chest is affected by your bust measurements. And we're going to be a little bit different, each of us. So I kind of evaluate this. Jen might have some technical info. I evaluate this based on like, if I'm looking at, a shirt that I'm wearing, or if I'm looking at a sweater on myself, like how much space am I seeing the distortion from my bust? And so for me, it's about a four inch space that I want to do all my shaping in for vertical bust starts. So I'll do all my increases in about an inch, inch and a half. I'll run that full bust circumference, my added increases for again, about an inch and then I'll start decreasing them out over that can be a little bit more space that, uh, especially if you're going top down, if you're decreasing out as you come down the body, you can space those decreases out a little more if you'd like, or have them a little closer together. The closer together that you put your shaping, the more of an extreme kind of cup like shape you're going to make. Um, yeah. So usually we want that to be a little bit more gradual. So I take, you know, a couple of inches to 
to work that out. And if I were doing a more dramatic increase, like four inches of added space, then I might, um, I might need to spread that out over a greater amount of space. But one way to do that, which would be a little more complex, would be to combine horizontal bust arts and vertical bust arts in those cases where you have a larger amount of inches or a larger amount of fabric to add in. So that's the long and short of it. What do you think, Jen? How'd I do? Great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would I would note that the natural waist on most size charts has that waist eight inches below the underarm. And we know that our bust is between the underarm and the waist. So um, I think that you could kind of do that shaping between half an inch beneath the bust apex, right? Because you like about an inch of um, of rows or rounds where you're working that increased circumference centered on that bust apex. So mm -hmm. if you're down a half an inch from that, then I think that you have the difference between that location and the ways to do all that shaping. And there are several ways to deal with it at the top, right? So when we're, we're, we're taking those stitches out on the bottom, we want them to be underneath the bust apex, which is usually about a third of the way in. Um, but your bust apex location may vary. Like if you've got them wide set titties, it may be further out. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're more of a Manana girly, like they may be closer in. Um, so kind of. What did you just call it? Manana? Madonna girly. You know, oh, like... Madonna. I thought you were talking about like a mono boob. Oh, yeah. Like, I do mean, you have like a, a Manana? Is that what No, it's Madonna. Madonna. Um, yes. But there are a couple mm -hmm. of different ways to get those stitches in at the top. So yes, you can increase them right above the bust apex, kind of like we would do with like a princess or a tailored seam. Or you can cast on more stitches for the neckline. You can mm -hmm. um, increase a little bit extra at the underarm and a little bit extra at the neckline to get there. So any way that you add that width through the top as you reach the bust will get you there. But do know that we are bell shaped. So, you know, we are very narrow here at the neck. We rapidly widen out to our torso and then we're straight down until we get to that bust apex. So if you're able to add those increases in, between the underarm and the bust apex somewhere, you'll probably get a better fit. And you don't have to do it all in one column either. You could do a little row of like five increases above each uh, cup if you wanted. So just getting mm -hmm. that width in there in a way that works for your stitch pattern is gonna give you um, a good success. So I could see even if you were doing a lace pattern, making the increases that you were supposed to make above those cups without making the corresponding decrease, right? And then taking it back out later. So there are all sorts of ways that you can play with adding those extra stitches and taking them out. Yeah, depending on the lace pattern, I might include rows of purl columns between the lace patterns across the front to hide the vertical bust starts. Um, or I might add, like if you're doing a Gansey, um, like a textured stitch, you know, you might choose to add those increases somewhere that they would really be invisible, like at the side seams. Um, it depends. Now, like the most precise fit is adding them in line with your point to point measurement, like your nipple to nipple measurement. I usually go a little bit wider than my nipple to nipple, but it's um, around that same area. I usually add about an inch on each side to that, just so that the increases are not um, like pointing directly at my nipples. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it just feels a little more modest, yeah. but you can, and I do think that's the best fit when I do vertical bust starts, but I have also put those increases on the sides where they're completely invisible and put the decreases there. And it's still a very good fit and a helpful modification for me. Um, like I did that with my birthday dress, instead of doing any horizontal bust row shaping, I did all vertical and I put the increases in the front on like the princess seams, but I put the decreases on the sides along the um, like leading to the waist point. And it was, it was great. It was a perfect fit for me. Yeah. yeah. So you can experiment with a lot of different ways to get those extra stitches in there. But like Jen said, most of the time, if you're adding them up at the shoulder too high, then you're going to be negatively impacting the fit of the garment um, in your, 
in your you're arm You're going to be adding volume to the upper front. And that may be something yeah. you need and it may not be. I mean, I've definitely seen knitters who are very full up here who could benefit mm -hmm. from that. So, yeah. I mean, too long, didn't read. Add the stitches where you want them. Yeah. Put them where your boobies are and then take them out when your boobs start going away. And well, I'm going to add one more thing here because, and this is not related to darts so much as it's related to adding stitches where we want them. Something that came up in um, a class recently was, okay, well, where do I add those stitches? They were specifically talking about modifying for a full hip, right? And they were working pluses, which is a garment that has a large graphic color work motif, right? So it's a dark field mm -hmm. with white plus signs on it. And, you know, my suggestion to them would be like, hey, instead of doing it at the sides and making a stacked A-line shape, what I would do is I would put one extra stitch between each of those motifs, right? So that the motif is spread out just a little bit. And then I would decrease out every other one in one row. And then I would decrease out the remaining extra stitches in another row so that we're spreading those stitches out gradually and creating something that's visually appealing. So y'all are going to be the artist here that's in charge of your finished project. And mm -hmm. you're going to be the expert on where to add stitches um, and how to work them into your pattern in ways that are creative that aren't necessarily something that we could easily write into a pattern that would work for everyone. So we'd love to hear your stories about how you're doing that. Um, so that we can share them with everyone. Yeah. And I love that way. That's basically the same thing I was saying with the lace. Mm -hmm. If you're doing this with lace, if you're looking where you have space to add extra stitches that won't disrupt that pattern, even if it means spreading the patterns out a little bit from each other. Yeah. It works really well to do that way. Um, it makes a very invisible product and it gives you the flexibility to take a garment that has a pattern and um, find a place to put them. You know, there are some, like I'm thinking of my Mary Raglan, which has lattice work in the front and it would be quite hard to add um, vertical bust starts into the lattice work. But if you have found a way, I would love to see it. Um, you know, in a lot of cases though, when you have pattern repeats that stack on top of each other, you can find a place to put them or you can create like a Raglan seam in the front or on the sides to yep. um, increase around so that it looks how it would look if it was sewn with like the pattern sort of blooming out and then pinching back in. So, yeah, yeah. we talk a lot about sneaking in um, extra width in the front only for raglan garments. You know, you're working top down, you've created your yoke, you split for the arm and the sleeve. But what if you just left those stitch markers in place in the front and then just mm -hmm. kept keeping on in pattern? Right. So that's one way to add with just where we need it up to that apex because that underarm is almost always, but not always. Like sometimes you'll see something like a dolman, um, but in a standard fit garment, those underarms are going to be above the bust apex. Mm hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Jordan. So, oh, Christina has a question about vertical bust arch. She said, if you're working vertical bust arts, do you also need to add extra length in the front? It depends. Some people will. And um, I personally don't because the shape of my breasts is not very teardrop. It's more, it's just really more wide set. So um, I can substitute horizontal bust arts for vertical bust arts. And it will still work for me to get um, a garment that doesn't pull. And so then it doesn't pull up in the front. Um, some people will find that they still need the short row shaping, especially if the shape of your breast is more teardrop shape. Or I think in cases where you have a more extreme hourglass, then you likely will need a combination of vertical and horizontal bust arts in order to get the best fit. Would you say that's true, Jen? Yeah, I find that most knitters who have breasts no matter what the measurements say, can almost always benefit from at least a little half inch adjustment. Um, I would say that if somebody is curious about whether or not this is going to be true for them, start by deploying these techniques in a top down raglan. So go ahead, get to that full bust apex, you know, put a lifeline in, block it, see what you think so far, go ahead, finish your decreasing out block it again, add another lifeline, see what you think. So run some experiments, right? It's just knitting. Um, and if you have to mm -hmm. pull back, you know, two inches and stock it in the body, like for a perfect fit and to get that information about your own silhouette, um, I think that that's really worth doing. If you get to the end of 
you've worked from the top down, you've increased for the bust, you've worked your bust circumference for an inch, you've decreased those stitches out, you block it and you put it on, and you see that your front is still higher than your side and your back. Um, I would pull back to the bust apex and I would work just a few short rows, just enough mm -hmm. to fill that gap and then see um, what what works for you. Everybody's different. Yeah. With the Carol bralette, which is one of my patterns, uh, and it, the Carol bralette includes vertical bust charts and horizontal bust charts in the cups th two through four. So cup one of the Carol bralette has no bust start shaping. And then cups two, three, and four have both horizontal and vertical bust starts. And I included both because it's a negative ease garment. So that means you're going to be losing more length from the additional stretch of the breasts than you would in a positive ease garment, right? And um, because I felt like it would be easier for knitters to work fewer short rows or not work the short rows, right? If they don't need them, then for people to add them in if they don't know how to do that amidst the vertical bust start shaping. So yeah. the Carol Brellette is super fine gauge. So it's not necessarily an easy project to um, experiment with this on, but it is a project that you can knit that's super functional, that includes both kinds of shaping. And it will, I think a lot of my UX knitters got good information about what they need personally from doing that project. Um, that they found like they needed fewer short rows or some people found they needed more. But um, a lot of them did find that with the added width, they didn't need the same amount of short rows that they would need otherwise. In a positive ease garment. Yeah, if I were going to write a negative ease garment, and I don't mean one that just has a full bust that's negative, but like the whole garment was negative ease, then I mm -hmm. would, if I were writing that, if I were grading that, I would include both length and depth because what we have to cover is that return. You know, if we were to measure our bodies from that internet point down to the bust in a positive ease garment, that tape measure then drops straight down per perpendicular to the floor. It doesn't have to cover the additional hypotenuse to return to the body. Right. So we that length impact is much more um, dramatic in a negative ease garment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. All right. So I think we super covered the vertical bus starts, but yeah. keep questions coming. I love it. Oh, and yeah. by the way, Marie and Paris, I mentioned this last week. As a reminder, this pattern does include vertical bus starts. Um, it does not include horizontal bus starts. You can add those in, but because of the wrap, wrapping, I decided to do vertical bust starts for this one. Um, so you can, if you've never worked them before, I do recommend picking up a copy of the pattern. And once you work vertical bust starts one time, I think you'll understand them really well. They're, they're pretty um, straightforward once they're in your knitting, you know, at least that's how I learn things. So Kim has a question for us as well. All right, Kim. Kim, Kim was recently knitting a sweater. She was knitting Hypatia and she, when she finished the body, this is a bottom up uh, set and sleeve. She finished the body and seamed the shoulders together. And she was afraid that her armhole was too deep. It was hitting just a, almost exactly an inch below the center of her underarm. She found that when she put the sleeve on that, that um, armhole that she felt like it was totally okay but it's got her wondering what, like where exactly should the underarm hit on your body when you're working an armhole? So like how much depth or how much positive ease do you want in the armhole of a garment? Um, I'm going to let you talk first this time. <laughs> yeah, I think the first thing I want to say is that until we put the sleeves and the necklines on diagonal lines or curves, they're they're not going to firm up as much as they will, right? They're what's called on the bias. And so they're stretchier um, and they dr drop and they drape, right? So we need to finish those um, additional steps before we know how something is actually going to sit in its final form. So anything that I would say to Kim's question is going to be predicated on the fact that we're talking about a schematic measurement here and not the way something looks or feels on the body. 
Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm designing, if I were with a set in sleeve, with any sleeve, the closer the underarm is to your body, both width wise, so ease circumference wise and ease depth wise, um, the closer that seam is to your underarm, the more range of movement you're going to have, the more you're going to be able to pick up your arm and move it without taking the whole garment with you. Um, so in a set in sleeve that is designed to be arm shape, we can have that seam be pretty close to the under and we can have it. I, I like about a half an inch of ease under the arm, but one ease, one inch of ease is not considered too much in any way. Um, I think anything between half and one is pretty standard in a set in sleeve. Um, in a raglan, I think that we need about the same with one caveat, which is that when we are talking about raglan depths, we have to also consider that the garment is covering the rise to the neck. So I feel like often a raglan can feel too deep if the total yoke measurement is one inch, if we're comparing it to arm size, right? So if I have an arm size of six inches and I add an inch to that, you know, we, we've just got to consider all of those pieces. So if I'm looking at a raglan and I want to assess the depth, I'm going to say, I know I've got about an inch and a half of rise here. And then my, uh, under my arm side depth is let's say seven inches. So I've got eight and a half inches. So when I look at my garment, I want that total yoke depth to be about nine inches. So if somebody was just looking at the armhole portion of that and was saying, well, that's seven, it looks like a lot more ease, right? It looks like an inch and a half of ease, or it looks like two inches of ease, but it's not because we've got to also cover that shoulder rise. Got it. Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry. I was like, yeah, I know I went real in the weeds there. I was following along and then I was like, do I understand this? And so that was meant to be just in my mind. Yeah. Long, didn't read. Didn't make sense. Like, okay, now I get it. Jen went into spreadsheet mode. Uh, to assess your raglan depth, I would look at the total yoke depth, which includes the raglan depth, which is the number of rows worked from the underarm to the neckline. And I would also take half of that shoulder width, right? So we call that the back neck rise. So I would take half of that. That's your total yoke depth. So if, if you've got three inches worth of stitches at the shoulder, your inch, an inch and a half of that is contributing to that yoke depth. So an inch and a half plus whatever that mm -hmm. yoke depth is. So I compare that to the total number of similar measurements on the body, which is wearing ease of about a half inch under the arm, arm side depth, plus about an inch and a half of shoulder rise. Yes. Yeah. And so um, firstly, Kim's here. She's excited that you're, that she said she loves the weeds. So Kim, I'm glad you're here because we're talking about <laughs> your <you>. question. <laughs> And, uh, and Diana said, she agrees. I'm not sure what she agrees with, but she might've been agreeing with me suddenly realizing that I understand. <laughs> <laughs> she might be agreeing with Kim saying that she also is loving the weeds. So see, this is why it's fun to do these live because you guys can actually like encourage us yes. when we get lost <laughs> and are afraid we're being too specific. So this podcast is for really thinky makers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The more we think about like who makes our patterns and engages in our community. Uh, we definitely know that y'all are a cerebral bunch of knitters. Uh, and so are we, so it makes sense, but I'm going to add to this that I personally prefer more ease in a set and sleeve than in a raglan that like having a slightly closer fit in a raglan works better for me. And for a sudden sleeve, it's not like I don't like a close fit in the underarm, but for a sudden sleeve, I feel like this maybe is just me. I'm kind of a sweaty person. <laughs> I'm kind of a sweaty person and I don't like it if I get all sweaty on my knits. <laughs> and like, so I'm wearing Marie and this is actually a pretty close fit raglan. It's unwrapped right now, so you can't see as much, but there's not a lot of ease, especially since I didn't modify the sleeves on this um, for myself and I am larger than my size chart in the armhole and the sleeve. So I have maybe only like a half inch of positive ease in my armhole, but, uh, or in my raglan depth, I guess is the better way of saying it, yoke depth. Uh, 
<laughs> Allison just said, best you live in a swamp. It makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much Allison for not point. making me feel bad about that. But to, to be fair, I was a sweaty person in the North also. <laughs> I just run hot. It's okay. Um, so I was going, I was saying, I have not a lot of ease in this, but it fits great. And I don't really feel like I get it sweaty when I've worn it. I've worn this, um, like I wore this all day at Woolen Folk underneath another jacket because it was so rainy and humid. And I was like all kinds of, damp. you know, if you heard, you know, it was all kinds of damp <laughs> at Woolen Folk. And um, I felt like because there wasn't a lot of ease, it worked out great that I could wear it under a jacket really well, et cetera. But yeah, often with a set in sleeve, I lean a little bit more towards an inch. Whereas with a raglan, I lean a little bit more towards a half inch, but that's personal preference. And there's not a lot of difference between those things. When you get to more like an inch and a half, two inches, et cetera, that's a little bit more of a design choice. That's going to give a different, somewhat distorted shape to that armhole and um whether yeah. it's an intentional design choice or not you might choose not to do that to modify an armhole if it is giving you a lot of ease i mean it might not be intentionally like that maybe your armhole is smaller than predicted for your size so talking about variances from the standard right if we play with the depth of an armhole in a set and sleeve that makes, if we make it longer, that makes the cap taller, which gives our garment a more formal, more structured look. The downside is then like we get the whole garment moves some when we lift our arm. So the longer the armhole is, the taller, more formal, and the less movement we have. The shorter it is, the more like a t-shirt it fits. A t-shirt's usually a set in sleeve, right? Mm -hmm. It's just one with a really short cap. And so the sleeves come off almost at like an 80 degree angle, right? So, you know, so we get more range of motion, but it does look more formal. We have a little bit more material in the underarm. So those are some of the trade-offs. You tend to make really pretty, slightly more formal knits too, right? Like I'm thinking of some like of Like Alice. Your, like Alice. Yeah. I'm thinking about Alice. Yeah. She would not look as classy with a shorter arm side depth. Now, if we go too yeah. long in a set in sleeve, we really can't lift our arms at all. Like then we start talking about like some of those swanchos, right? That you yeah. can't do anything. So those are some of the limits in a set in sleeve. Whereas a raglan hangs um, at a diagonal from the neck and that line goes across the body. And so no matter what we do, we can almost always at least move our arm. So we can play a little bit more. A really shallow armhole in a raglan is going to give us plenty of room for layering and feel really casual and sporty. Um, something like breaker that has like a dolman length underarm, you know, I'm not going to be, when I lift my arm, the garment's going to go with it. But it's going to have like a different feel, a different aesthetic. Um, so we can kind yeah. of play with those expectations. And then in order to make it so that you can at least lift your arm some, you're going to, in those deeper arms, be looking for a lot of positive ease at the arm so that you still have the ability to make that, um, that change in angle um, and keep your arm within the fabric that's available. Yeah. It's, otherwise, it's like knitting shibari. I don't know what that is. Oh, shibari is Japanese bondage. Oh, right. Not, is that the knot tying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like rope. So I'm just thinking of like a really deep armhole with like no ease in the bicep and your arms are like right. pinned to your sides. Yeah. Right. <laughs> cool. Your yarn just We've like so wraps tightly today. around you. <laughs> well, right. So now that we went to a weird semi-sexual place, um, now that I brought it there, I feel that we were complete. <laughs> All the boxes <backwards> checked. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the long and short, LOL, pun intended, uh, of, of our moles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I would add that with a drop shoulder, armhole depth is really different because that armhole isn't going around your arm site. It's probably going around some part of your upper arm. So in a one wild drop shoulder pattern, we tell you where we think it's going to hit your arm so that you can check 
that measurement and compare it with the armhole depth. Um, if they don't give you that in a drop shoulder pattern, you're going to want to look for that cross shoulder measurement and try and figure out where it's going to hit you on your own body so that you can um, look at the armhole depth from that point. That's right. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything all right, else in the right. chat? I mean, I feel like we went, I mean, I feel like if we cover another no, topic here. Everybody got very quiet. People got <laughs> nope right out of here. I know. Well, we, if anyone has any other questions, please let us know. Otherwise, um, we we made it to 35 minutes. We talked. It's an episode. <laughs> <laughs> we did indeed talk. Um, so we have some fun stuff coming up on February 19th. Um, oh, Allison is requesting a newsletter on armhole depth. She said that might be super useful as a visual learner. Thank you for requesting that. Allison, we'll put it in the, in the list of things that we can write about for you for sure. Um, so February 19th, we have, um, uh, night coming up. What is the name of the yarn shop? It's in Pittsburgh, it's and correct? Yarn, and we are still waiting to finalize details. So I'm a little nervous oh. to say too much, but um, we think we're going to have an event with Moon and Yarn here next month. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> 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 if we don't talk about it again, you'll know. Um, we didn't finalize those details all the way. But uh, we're excited to be in Harrisburg doing photography in February. In March, Jen is definitely going to be at the Rose City yarn crawl in portland and we've got patterns for you we have uh two patterns coming out tomorrow marie and paris which i'm wearing and breaker which jen is wearing they are finally coming live for you if you've already pre-ordered you'll be able to download them if you haven't then you can buy them yeah. um and we're gonna have we have more coming quite soon so stay tuned because march is also going to be a really great awesome. knitting month yeah. really great knitting month for everyone yeah oh we've got ux knits if you check um the links in we'll put them in the description here but they're also right now currently live in our instagram bios you can find ux knit links for both um my tank design betty's mystique and jen's tank soft walk those ux knits have started today but we have space for a couple more folks each. I think you still have space. Yeah. Yeah. I have one, size one, size seven, size nine, 10, and 11. Yeah. I have size one and sizes six to 10. I can take more people in any of those sizes. I might even be able to take someone in size two, which is crazy because usually that's a, that's gone real fast. Anyway. Uh, so if you want to join, go ahead and join us send an application and um i announced i announced all of the announcements i can think of that's a lot of announcements <laughs> yeah that's good i feel well announced all right awesome yeah, so we we've it. been announced i pronounce us announced <laughs> <laughs> uh let's all get on with our wednesday or whatever day of the week you're watching this and um let us know leave us a comment if you have questions about what we covered or what we didn't. And uh, let us know in the comments if you like this live format for our episodes. It feels more like hanging out with y'all and talking about fit, which is what I want for this podcast. But on the other side, um, we're not good at tech. So if you were waiting for us today, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we'll be going back and forth. So yeah, yeah, we'll see you guys in the Slack channel. Show us what you're working on. Show us your mods. Show us your favorite underarm depth. We want to hear from you. Yeah. Have a good one. Happy knitting, everybody.